May that one protect us both. May that one nourish us both. May we work together with great vigor and illumination. May we be strong, may we not unnecessarily cavil with each other. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. So there's a question for before us, and that is, why do we prostrate before a shrine? Why do we prostrate before revered people such as monks? And more specifically, why do we prostrate to the Guru? And these are appropriate questions since the 24th is Guru Purnima, that is a special day selected Purnima means full moon, an auspicious occasion where we register our particular devotion to the Guru. And so what is the significance of that? That's uh, one thing. And so why do we make a prostration? Now, I have to point out not everybody makes a prostration, but if you do it, what's the point and why is it there? So I began by talking about a psychologist, a cognitive, cognitive psychologist, I think his name is Don Holland. And he has a remarkable point of view that actually really highlights the questions asked in our Eastern philosophy, namely the reality that we are experiencing, is it real? And he's come to a conclusion, no, it's not. Now he hasn't just drawn that from the air, he has, started off with a premise because every theory that is put out in science starts off with a few assumptions and as long as we go along with those assumptions the rest can be developed and followed so his one assumption is that the biologically evolutionary process favors those to survive who react to the world as a reality around themselves. Those who dismiss it don't survive. Those who take it on board, they survive. But it is a mistaken identity. When we look at the world and experience the world, are we really experiencing it uh, in, in absolute truth? And if we look at it closely, it cannot be. And I was using the example, if we look at a person, a person may use some facial expressions and we can interpret some things, but we have no access to the full capacity of what that person is feeling or their memories or any uh, visual accessing they make. Visual accessing means if you ask, please recall when was your last holiday and you look in a certain direction, you are using the eyes to access the other part of the brain. And the brain is divided by the corpus callosum and into left and right hemispheres, and they distinctly have different functions. Uh, so the one aspect of the brain wants to gloss things over and cover things over. And we can use that in order to be try and be positive in a world that is intrinsically full of pain and suffering but we're in denial of it. So we're continuously superimposing our version of reality on what is. Why am I saying all this? Because what the truth is, we have to continuously tune into it. What we assume it is, and what we are assuming is, is pure consciousness. He's making a statement. In textbook studies and before students, he will tell them, we are only using uh, about 1% of our mental activity is fully conscious. The 99% is unconscious. But he said, actually, the truth is the reverse. 
99% is consciousness and only 1% is unconscious. That's how he's putting it. He's putting it as consciousness being the absolute ground of all being and everything else is its expression. And he's come to this conclusion by a careful study analysis and using mathematical models with regard to his first proposition. So in short, we have two very powerful survival genetic directives. And one is orientated toward survival through propagating the species. And the one that propagates the most successfully is the winner in the biological evolutionary struggle. Sex selection is how Darwin has put it. The other one is something to do with a struggle, but we don't register it as struggle. Struggle is not appealing. And so we then find the best means to sustain the physical existence that we have. And when we become more sophisticated, we sustain the cultural aspect of the mind that we have. And when we become even more sophisticated, we start searching, we use the mind as a searchlight to find out what is the truth. Now, what we are saying is two methods are there. The one method is to discriminate between what is real and what is unreal on a continuous basis and exercise absolute self-control, control of all the sense organs, the organs of information, the organs of action, the organs of reaction. And in doing that, we find out this permanent truth. In Vedanta, we call this permanent truth Brahman. That's the path of the jnani, but the other path, which is suitable for most people, is to develop a sincere love of God, to take all our emotional reactions about the world, all the goings on inside the mind, which we know are there, but we cannot define them, nor do we really know exactly why they're there. To take all of that and pull it into one central emotion, dedicated love, and steer it toward a personal ideal of God. And that personal ideal of God is not a fancy because it is this formless consciousness that agrees to shape itself just as water agrees, as it were, to shape itself into ice, an iceberg. And it does that so that we may know it. And once the sun of knowledge comes, the iceberg then is nicely diffused, melted back into the formless aspect. This is the way that most of us do it. It is the sweetest way. It is a convenient way. We don't have to give up anything. We don't have to control anything. We simply have to take all our energy and direct it in a loving, selfless way. Why would we do that? Because the object of our devotion is entirely lovable. That means it's just a flow of goodness to us, mostly unnoticed by us. Without it, the sun doesn't shine, the moon does not reflect, the air is not available, the oxygen-rich environment isn't there, the diaphragm doesn't move up and down, the heart doesn't beat, the thoughts don't flow in the mind, we can call this a continuous flow toward us without asking for any return. So worship essentially amounts to an immense gratitude, a song of gratitude, phrased like that, returning a little bit of what we receive just out of spontaneous love because we are loved. And so the embodiment for that is our chosen ideal, our ishtadevata. So while we're always in the presence of that entity and we are never absent from it, nor is it absent from us, the fact of the matter is that when we notice it specifically, when it is presented in a specific form, uh, I'm going to give you an example. Bill Martin, a number of you have been there now or at least, let me think, three of you at least have been there probably. 
maybe two of you. In any event, in Belo Mutt, there is a statue of Ram Krishna. This is not any ordinary statue. It is well known and well, well experienced that Ram Krishna himself, the Lord in that form, goes and sits there when the shrine opens and departs when it closes. And people have seen this with their own eyes. Now, some can believe and some cannot believe it, but the ones who say it have the utmost credibility. And they're not insane. So these entities can be seen. Ram Krishna himself gives the example. In desperation, he wants to see, is this mother of the universe that is embodied in a mere statue made from basalt, is it something that is actually real? Is it vibrant? Is it living? Because great poets have dedicated great songs to this entity. Standing before, this representation of it. It's not unusual. For example, if you have a photograph of your, one of your beloved relatives, immediately the mind goes to the relative itself. It's a means to an end. And you can take it one step further, that if that entity is entirely omnipresent, if it's permeating everywhere, for out of love for you, decides to form itself into a particular form, a picture or a statue, then it is a living present presence. In our shrine, we keep a lamp burning continuously. It's an electric lamp, but it, it burns continuously. In Roman Catholic churches, they do the same. Is either an electric or electronic lamp, or it is an actual burning uh, lamp fueled by oil and topped up. In the old days, that's how they would do it. Nowadays, probably electrical. Well, what does it symbolize? It symbolizes that there is a living presence there. And when people know it, it gives a special atmosphere to the building. In contrast to that, there are certain religions, and I don't want to be controversial about this, that have made churches into meeting rooms, made churches into courtrooms. I'll always remember going to the Netherlands and seeing a church stripped away from all, stripped of all the statues, inside and outside, and made into a kind of preaching room. And the whole atmosphere really has changed because the function has changed, the vibration has changed, the intention has changed. You may as well use any form of building. And Pentecostal Christians have decided that they would. So when you go to these American Pentecostal churches, they are, I'm not judging in any way, but I'm just stating the fact, they are huge halls, more like auditoriums are built. Something along the lines of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, um, a place where plays are put on, but much vaster or concerts are put on or something of that nature. Complete with band, music and so on. But the sacredness of the presence isn't there. That's the point. And as soon as that is there, it becomes sacred. It is the secret and key to all places of pilgrimages. That the intention of the pilgrim infuses that area with sanctity and we feel something special it's a mutual give and take you go there with the intention of receiving something and in return something is given that's the key to places of pilgrimage sacred places uh, forms what we call pratima and pratika sacred pratima now swami vivekananda gives a whole chapter on this, on these Pratima and Pratika, that is, representations of the Supreme, either in a, in a, a kind of a symbolic form or in a, an actual anthropomorphic form. But what he says is, what is, is this in any way idol worship? It is, it is if mere idol worship, we can say, 
if you're taking the object to represent something that will give you in return for a prayer, something that is more like a natural force. As soon as you ask for something, you have made God a supply agent, a reduced God to a physical entity that supplies the world in a subtle way, no doubt. But when you now represent it and see it for what it is, that is that one without a second, that absolute, that single entity that rules the world, that infuses the world with its presence, then that now becomes, uh, becomes a real worship. That alone is real worship, real worship of the, that one entity. So now if you go into a shrine or a temple with this idea that your understanding of God, your form of God sits there enthroned. That's the whole meaning of temples and churches. Sits there enthroned. Naturally, how will you respond? And all the Hindu worship is royal worship. Even when you do the arti, in the evening, it is royal worship. Some people who come uh, on a Sunday don't understand the import of it until it's explained. So five items are normally presented, say, in a simple RT, and what do they represent? First of all, there are various layers and levels. You can imagine that the Lord of the Universe is sitting there enthroned as if in a palace. That is why Hindu temples are constructed more like palaces. And they're constructed in such a way that they represent going from the outside progressively to the inside. So the temples, particularly in South India, will require a perambulation. And every time you go in increasing internal circles within, 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 you're making a meditation. The whole purpose of this is meditation. That is why the word for temple in Hinduism is uh, the mandir. It comes from the same root as manasa, mind. It's a, actually a meditation done in a very physical way and therefore endorsing and underlining a meditative mental movement. So the outside of the temple represents the physical and then you go to the next courtyard and that represents the energetic and then you go into the inner, inner courtyard and that rep represents the mental and then you go into the inner courtyard and that represents the intellect and then the bliss and then right in the heart, the garba, the womb, the blissful area and there the Lord resides as the Lord would reside of the size of a thumb in your own heart. The expression given by the Upanishads, of the size of a thumb, not that it's actually that size, but for meditation purposes, it's useful. Naturally, uh, one king you may bow to, a mortal king, an earthly king, you may bow to, whatever the protocol is. When you get knighted by the queen in England, she takes out a very threatening, sharp instrument called a sword. You wait with bated breath, thinking it can go several ways. Puts it for, thankfully on your shoulder, but what is your position? You are kneeling, imagine. And so what will you do for that monarch of all monarchs, the emperor or empress of the entire universe? You'll get down as low as you can. You're prostrate in complete submission and something happens because what you're getting is what is called darshan, a, a, a looking, a viewing. Gazing at that one and that one gazing at you, mutual gazing taking place. And that's all the reason, that's the whole purpose of it. So you are getting a blessing. Now, if you feel that you're getting a blessing, what will your reaction be? Thankfulness. And in order to get the full blessing, the ego has to be knocked out and you have to be humble. Humility is the answer. Now, the one thing in monastic life is that the ego, the first lesson, in the whole of 
disciplined monastic life is to knock out the ego completely, destroy it. When we look at Christ on a cross, you have a philosophical bent of mind or a psychological bent of mind even, then you will think that this is the ego and we can cross it out, completely destroy it. Because this association of this unreality, this material, this molecular body is a myth. It's not true. It comes and goes, but there's something that remains as pure consciousness. This man, Don Holland, puts it in computer terms. What we are seeing as the world in front and internally is just the interface, just like in your computer, you have symbols and what have you, and it's just the interface. The real computer is in the internal workings, in the diodes and cathodes or whatever is in there, <coughs> excuse me, in the electrical connections, in the subtle soldered wiring, in the circuit boards and all of that, that is the real part. But we're happy not to know anything about it because it doesn't function for us to know it. It only functions if we operate the interface. In that same way, we're dealing with the world in a remote way. Far more underlying this, far more attractive than diodes and uh, connections is, and circuit boards, is this great, great supreme entity this divine that stands within, providing us with all the facilities that we have to survive, to live, to evolve, to change, to operate. And so the answer comes if, the, if life has no, has no uh, substance to it, no reality to it, then why are we bothering? Should there be any purpose in life? Yes, because you wouldn't want to take all those symbols and put them into the bin. Supposing you write a big book and it's taken you uh, six or seven years and you somehow move that into the bin and discard that and then empty that bin, you've thrown all that away. So you don't discard the symbol or the product of the symbol in because you think that the reality is all the workings inside it you can take the analogy a bit further because an electrical current that's supplying that as well in that same way all our interactions with all the senses are just an interface now if we understand and deepen our understanding of this consciousness itself that sits behind that behind the interface, the interface takes on a new importance, a new meaning. It's not discarded. So the, on uh, special days, such as days of the apostles around Krishna at Bilu Mat and many of the other Mats, on those days, there's a very funny thing you know, in a way that takes place that people go to the senior monks, whoever is senior, and you go and you make a prostration. Or at least you touch the feet. And there's a, the funniness is because there's a little bit of a scramble, people scrambling to prostrate and so on and so forth. And naturally, the more significantly spiritual the person is, the lower you will make yourself. And there's nothing lower than the ground. Full prostration. Now, in, by the way, it's done in many other religions too. Uh, for example, when you take uh, monastic vows or priest vows or what have you in the Roman Catholic Church, a full prostration is made. At Easter on the Good Friday, again, a full prostration is made. The priest does a full prostration on the ground. This is not only deleting your ego and being extremely humble, doing away with any sense of pride, but it's also a sign of submission, submission to God's will. This is why in Islam, this idea of Islam submission to God's will is symbolized by various standing and kneeling and prostrating positions. Prostration is very, very important in all of this. 
And in the Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna gives that as a means, prostrating before the holy ones, prostrating before the Guru. Deleting, in other words, your position of self-image, importance, etc., and acknowledging that you are prepared to open yourself up to a divine flow of grace. So what should you do in those prostrations? What should your mental frame be? You should be a recipient, a recipient of grace flowing. Because if it's to a person, the person's point of view would be they are also declutching the ego and standing poised in that position where there's only that pure being, pure Atman, that stands as a blessing entity. And so with that in mind, everybody, everything in that environment gets blessed. The guru is not seen as different from the god. But how so? Isn't that a little peculiar? Isn't that some kind of blasphemy? Well, Jesus was crucified for such a blasphemy, of course. Well, no. And I explain many times why we think that the Guru and God is the same. You can imagine now there's a great reservoir, God as a reservoir, the divine as a reservoir full of grace and goodness and blessedness, and a pipeline that comes from it, a reservoir on the hill, pipeline coming down, water coming down by gravity, serving a town. And at the end of it was a faucet. And you open the faucet and get the flow of the water. Grace is essentially a flow. What we call the sun is a flow of grace that gets encapsulated in our interpretation as the sun beaming and continuing its grace, not discriminating between who will receive it. The whole solar system receives it, but the special beneficiary is the earth. Special beneficiary where we live. We ourselves, therefore, are that beneficiary. The moon is only that grace configured into that reflection. The earth is only that grace configured into a rotating sphere. And that grace is configured into a body that we can call you and me and so on. And animals and plants and all the rest. It's that same entity, same divine entity agreeing to be molded everywhere. That means every form is his form. But not every form comes into the category of goodness and love and blessing. But the Guru comes into that category because all they're doing is being an open channel for divine grace to flow. Instead of using the ego as a suppressing and introverted thing, thing that is narrow and squeezed, it becomes generous and opening and becomes a gateway to all and sundry. We get this great, great blessing, this idea from this Kalpatru day that is there on the 1st of January, where the greatest, greatest of teachers and those that are surely worthy of being labeled a chosen ideal because so close in historical proximity to us. These entities, we have to study closely. We have the advantage of studying these closely. We can study a Jesus, but we only have a few small records and that Jesus is historically remote from us by some 2,000 years. But if you are a Christian, then you should think, how does Jesus walk? May I walk with him by the Sea of Galilee? May I sit with him? May I serve him? May I cook for him? May I prostrate before him? May I get the fullness of his blessings? May I sit and drink in every word of his, every sacred word, every syllable. You see? May I walk as he walks. When asked, what does a person of steady wisdom look like in the Bhagavad Gita? How does he walk? How does he talk? See? All of those kinds of things. We have to study that. Similarly, the teacher is an echo of that. 
How does the teacher think? What is his wiring? Surely different from the normal so, 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 uh, person who gets up in the morning and works, eats and drinks, sleeps and repeats. Some different way of thinking is there, different approach, a different formula that is able to pass on to another. And so when the teacher is come across, a frustration also goes there. And uh, sometimes you decide to do it, a full frustration, depends how you feel. And other people not knowing the meaning, well, briefly, I've <laughs> had people just making for the knee or something, you know, uh, it's, uh, some people's customers like that and so on. That's not the important thing. The important thing is what do I have in mind when I do it? What I have in mind is God himself stands there and therefore I'm supplying worship. A feeling of gratitude and thankfulness is what is going through me. And a willingness to receive a blessing on the other side. So let me be blessed. Let me be in a condition to be blessed, which means let me declutch all my ego so that I have an openness to receive grace and blessing. Why not do that? So a prostration is a very wonderful means, A, for being, for being truly humble, for being prepared to be the lowest of the low. Just to give you an illustration, you know, Ram Krishna as a teacher, he hated the idea of teacher. He hated the label of teacher. He didn't want to be called guru. He didn't want to be called acharya, teacher, none of these terms. And he would much rather be viewed as God's servant. And to people's embarrassment, he himself would do the prostration to devotees. <laughs> you see, like Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. And some people, some Orthodox people feel, oh, that's, that's a curse on me now. I can't allow that to happen. But what is his point of view? He's only seeing God there and sitting there. And what is your reaction? Let me serve. So it is the same all around. The faucet in the example is the guru, is the teacher. And eternally connected with the cosmic mind. Eternally connected through a lineage which we can call in the analogy a pipeline, back to the divine reservoir fully. And so when a prostration occurs, what is a teacher or a holy person's point of view? They withdraw into that poised position that is Brahman, that Atman, they sit in a state of poise, they sit where God sits on his throne and blesses unconditioning from there. That means it's a transformation in the recipient's life when that happens. And so the recipient understanding that will internally reciprocate by saying, let me be a, gener a reciprocant of this generosity that is given to me. I don't care if my life changes or not from it, but let me receive it gratefully, thankfully. And in that same way, let me submit fully to the other, knowing that that entity will guide me, will always be an avenue for divine grace to flow. That's the idea of it. Uh, removing the dust from someone's feet, of course, is a thoroughly oriental custom that was there. And when I say orient, I mean Middle East onwards. It is there in Jesus' day and was there, and that is why Jesus washes the feet. When you enter into a house, you take your shoes off, and the host may, first thing, wash the feet. And so in puja, in worship, that's one of the things that is done. Let me wash, let me wash the feet, let me wash the rest of you, let me dress you, let me clothe you, let me perfume you. Let me show my pure devotion for you unconditionally, without any thought of any return from it. Of course, now and then we want things, that's okay. But out of love of God, why would I bother him day and night, day and night, give me this, give me that? Well, much better to say, Lord, let me give you whatever it is. 
Let me be the giver. So there's a wonderful story about that. They may have told you many times before. It is not my story. It comes from uh, Rabindranath Tagore. So he tells the story of a beggar. All the days he has nothing, no occupation, no work. He reduced to begging. And so every day he managed to gather in a small handkerchief some rice to cook for that day. And on the one occasion, he has a few grains of rice to cook for the evening meal. But good fortune comes his way, seemingly, because the great king comes by with all his entourage and people standing by the side of the road, waving, jostling to get a good position, jostling to get at least a touch or a conversation. And his great fortune, he's there in the front line and the king comes down from his elephant. In those days, the throne was kept on the back of an elephant. And he thought, my fortune has changed. This king is going to give me enormous wealth. And his heart almost stops because the king is approaching him and looking directly at him. And the king says, my son or my citizen. Uh, and he pauses, yes, this is the chance. And the king says, I am the king, you know that. He says, yes, your majesty. Good. What will you give me? <laughs> the beggar is shocked. What will I give you? I have to give him something since he asked. So he opens his handkerchief and gets out the smallest possible grain of rice he can find and puts it there in the king's palm. And the king, satisfied, goes off. And uh, muttering a little bit and disappointed enormously, the beggar goes home and opens his handkerchief, and there he finds the smallest grain of gold. And he says, ah, if only I had given the whole lot, I would have been a rich man. There's a wonderful story that illustrates this. So this idea of, uh, is a strange idea for many Western people to make a prostration to another human, but only because they regard that entity as a human. And uh, in some cultures, of course, prostration is not a physical prostration. It may be a bow. The Japanese are good at doing that. And it depends in Japanese culture, of course, how deep your bow, bow is depends on social status and all the rest of it and how much shows, in any event, shows an element of respect. And if there's a person elevated, let's say the emperor of Japan, you give a very, very deep, deep, deep bow, the deepest possible. But the emperor will bow, again, bow to you in a less dramatic way, saying that there's a dignity in you also. There was one of our devotees here made a YouTube video, asked uh, two swamis here, myself and Swami Vimoksananda, to participate in a video which was orientated around the subject of namaste. Now, namaste is a greeting using the Anjali mudra, placing the palms together. It is used in temples. It is used for worship, and not just here, but up here and here, the higher you see, the higher you go, the more devotion. But in just encountering people, it has now become a habit because handshaking has now realized or it's very unhygienic. All kinds of germs and COVID virus can be transmitted to us. So everybody has adopted this namaste position. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, in temple worship, the thumbs are made to face you, but in greeting others, and it's literally nama, that is a great salutation to you. I am saluting you. But what is the fundamental you? It is the God inside you. I know God is inside me also. So the thumbs are pointed to me, but the prayer for position is orientated toward you. And I am seeing and therefore revering the God in you. That should be our normal attitude everywhere, seeing God in all beings and all people. Because that is the fundamental reality 
and we are duped by our genetic gut to think in a different way. But it is all just genetic survival, that's all. There's nothing more to it. We have to learn to take that as an obstacle and bypass it. And the evolution then becomes, for us, the natural way of a natural flow of perfection that removes obstacles for us. You can call that God's grace if you want. But the urge behind all evolutionary change is the urge toward perfection, coming from perfection, of working through. And when in Swami Vivekananda's uh, commentary on a certain stand, a certain aphorism, certain sutra in Patanjali Yoga Sutras, that good and bad deeds are not the direct causes of transformations, and using the analogy of getting water canaled into a farmer's fields, the only thing that stops the flow is when you put an obstacle there. You put some obstruction there and you feel free to remove it and the water flows. You don't have to go and fetch water. Water has a characteristic, it will flow. And it will flow according to gravity. And if you give it a small slope, it will flow. Three, four degrees is necessary. That's all that's necessary. Even a slight slope, that's all that is required. And so uh, all of spiritual life becomes this exercise of removing obstacles. And uh, prostration is one of those things. It is mentioned also in the Bhagavatam. It is recommended in the Bhagavatam. If you really want to see and register and tune into and worship the God in all beings, then take the lowest, lowest outcast that you can find and prostrate before that, before a donkey do it, before an elephant do it, before a Brahmin do it and an outcast equally do it to all creatures and all beings. What a wonderful statement the Bhagavatam gives. Now supposing, now that is a, a serious recommendation of spiritual life. Now supposing we have a reservation about doing that actually, literally and physically, although we shouldn't really, never mind. Supposing we do, reserving some level of shyness, you know, then at least we can do it mentally. So it is all about your frame of mind when you do that prostration. Put yourself in a frame of mind that you are being blessed. And this is called darshan. That is all. That is the sight and the influx of divine grace flowing to you. It is being accessed through that humble act of prostration. Uh, so uh, Jean and Larry and myself, we have been, is Dermot in? No, maybe not. We of course have been to the president of the Ramakrishna order. The Ramakrishna order encompasses Ramakrishna Martin mission highest authority there, representative of Ramakrishna in, a, in his 90s. And there, prostration is made, you see. Even the most senior monks will prostrate, and give a full prostration even. So like that, it is your privilege. I don't know if I answered your question now. Yes, Swamiji, you did. Okay, good, good. Thank you. But don't keep the mind blank, you see. Take it as an exchange of giving and receiving. So giving the attitude of, of submission on the one hand and receiving the grace on the other. Was there a question or comment? Yeah. Swami, can I say, first of all, Rohini, thanks for asking the question. Uh, absolutely very relevant. And um, yes, a couple of points, as you said, um, us as Westerners um, would, and I, I stick for myself, I would have had a difficulty with frustration. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I didn't even come from a religion that genuflected, you know, we, we just didn't do anything like that at all. So uh, all this frustration was um, alien to me. In a great sense of the word, um, 
And slowly but surely, yes, I did come to see the, when it was explained to me, it made perfect sense. And it, it, I could see the absolute relevance of it. Um, and I wouldn't have, uh, I, I would consider it an honor now to um, prostrate in front of it, Swami. One other question uh, I have in relation to something you said earlier on in your talk was in relation to going into uh, what was it, Larry? Like a big auditorium, a big auditorium type place instead of a temple. Mm. Um, and the, the 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 lack of the sense of holiness, perhaps, in that place. I may have got that wrong, but. Is it not where, uh, as Jesus said, where two or three of my brethren are gathered together, there I will be also. So even though there's not the shrines and things there, can there not still be a sense of holiness just where two or three are gathered together? Oh, oh yes, of course, because the intention is only one thing, you see. Um, the only thing, of course, I would say is that uh, the benefit of having a dedicated hall infused with holiness is there. You see, mosques, for example, uh, are denuded of all, all, all vestiges of what they might consider to be idol worship. That means, though, all the art and culture is removed. And uh, so it is a functional place, there's no doubt. And uh, in these great gatherings, absolutely, the intention is there and the emotion is there, absolutely. But because they didn't, don't consider, they consider it merely to be a gathering place. Uh, you know, the intention is the one that carries. Uh, but, the, but the people themselves absolutely will benefit from the atmosphere that they created by people, among people, there's no doubt. Um, we just, we have to warn against excess of emotion in such places though, as well. Uh, so there has to be some subtlety about it. Uh, for example, we can go to many political rallies and people have gone to political rallies and a good speaker has moved every man to tears on every woman to tears and assembled people for their cause. Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people in mass gatherings, see? But uh, such a person would be a Hitler or a Mussolini, you've seen that. So, when you assemble in the big halls and the music is there and so on and so forth, there can be a sense of emotional surge. But when the emotion outweighs the reasoning, there's something like a danger, something like what Swami Vivekananda called howling fanatics. But the charisma of it is wonderful. And for that reason, that spread also from the Pentecostal movement into the Roman Catholic Church as well. So there's a charismatic movement in the Roman Catholic Church also, because they understand the great value of that. And they understand also that it must have been there in the early days. And if you take that Karpot through day, what can you describe the scene as? Pure euphoria. Pure euphoria, you see. So there are different levels and types and uh, issues to do with it. Yeah. Uh, so it's not that, it's that there are great advantages to being able to go into a dedicated place without anybody else. And even if there are other people, supposing you do a course on meditation and so on, you go into a room and so on, other people are there. The first thing that you should understand is it's only God in you that is there. There's nothing else there. That frame of mind helps you to concentrate. So, um, so I have nothing against the you know, hippodrome uh, assemblies and so on and so forth. And I think that has great merit. But in terms of the actual place, 
the place is as is has the value, the same value as it has it is seen to have. And that's yeah. The thank you, Swami. Um, that is the one thing I, I absolutely well, a lot of things I learned from the trip to India, but one of them was uh, because it was probably so alien to me growing up. Um, in that type of environment uh, to worship, um, but absolutely very relevant and um, yes, very meaningful. So yeah, yeah, I, I, I can see the big difference. Yes, yes, and, and it's horses for courses also. Uh, you take, for example, some great saints in all religions who decided they'll have nothing. They'll go into a cell uh, with four bare walls and that's all they want. And you have examples of that here in Ireland. You go to Skellig's Island there, the, you know, where the early monastic cells were there. They didn't want anything else. They just wanted the nature around them. And they were quite happy in their stone built huts. And, uh, but you see, these are dedicated types of people. You take on what is helpful to you or what is not. In Mayavati, for example, which is one of their dead ashrams there. Uh, so uh, Swami Vivekananda wanted at least a few of the ashrams to be non-dualistic. And he was visiting Mayavati and he saw there a picture of Ramakrishna and he shook his head and said, oh, I see the old man got in here as well. And he asked them to remove the picture, please. So there are ashrams that, are, that don't have any imagery or whatever. And we have to select what suits us personally. Everyone's an individual. That's the point. This is, this is the, the science called Pratika and Pratima. And uh, if you read Swami's uh, lectures on Bhakti Yoga, you'll find a specific chapter on this subject. And he tells us that um, it uh, that because it's centered around criticism of idols or use of pictures and so on, Swami Vivekananda was entertained by one of the great Maharajas, and the one of the prime ministers said, "Yes, yes, all that is very well, but you see this idol worship. The British got this into their heads that this is a kind of paganism. Even today." Uh, Protestant uh, missionaries will go and insult the various forms of deities directly outside the temple and say our greatest wish is to kick and destroy a shivaling. That's what they're saying. So they're, they don't understand the depth of meaning behind it. And so the question of uh, idols, idol worship, and so on and so forth, raises its head amongst Abrahamic religions, meaning Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, or some forms of Christianity. Of course, the Catholics have no difficulty with it, and the Eastern Orthodox have no difficulties with it. But at one stage, they did. There was an iconoclastic movement in the Eastern Orthodox Church that decided to do away with every image because they were being... Uh, they were being out uh, maneuvered and battered by the Muslims who were monotheists and had no, absolutely no representation of the divine that was anathema to them. And so they thought our losses, our lack of victories must be due to this. Maybe we are doing idol worship, but it does, didn't last long. Human nature came in and said, no, and the Eastern Orthodox icons are incredible because they are living, seem to be, or deemed to be living entities. And it's the same thing as well. You don't just have a picture or a statue in front of you, it's infused with divinity if you make it infused. As part of puja, by the way, the start is to take the divinity that sits in this temple made from flesh and blood and you insert it and put it into the other one. And all of Puja's royal worship. I was starting to talk about the Arti, 
we're offering, of course, royal worship. But more than that, we're offering all the dhanmatras, the particular elements, uh, one at a time. We're offering fire, we're offering um, water, we're offering air in the form of a fan, and we're offering agasha, space, in the form of clothing, a piece of cloth. Um, so these five things are actually being offered. And we're offering the earth by offering a flower, the product of the earth. Then at another level, we're offering royal worship when the flower offering is offering one's own heart. See, like that. So it all has a, 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 a deep meaning, if you understand the meaning. If you don't understand the meaning, it's superstition. And we have to do away with superstition. Either you explain the meaning and somebody takes it on board, or you do away with it completely. That's the only answer. We take on what is helpful to us. We reject what is not helpful to us. What is helpful to one person may not be helpful for another. This is the concept of pluralism and unity of religions. Om Shanti. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. Oh.